Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. Now, my guest in this part of the programme is one of the most senior diplomats in the European Union and a man tasked with a uniquely delicate relationship, that between the EU and the member state that chose to leave the bloc, the United Kingdom. Now, their new relationship is just over three months old, uh, having been provisionally applied since January the 1st, with significant disruption for many businesses and individuals amid new trading rules. Uh, Joao Valle de Almeida is a Portuguese diplomat who previously served as the EU's ambassador to the UN from 2015 to 19, and before that, as its ambassador to the United States. Joao Valle de Almeida, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. I'd just like to start off, uh, in the last few days, people in the UK and elsewhere uh, have been paying their respects to the late uh, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, uh, whose funeral took place on Saturday, the 17th of April. Uh, now, I know that the EU delegation actually lowered its flag to half-mast uh, as a mark of respect uh, for this most European of British royals. He was born in Greece, of course. Well, I think it, it, there was a spontaneous uh, uh, wave of uh, gratitude and, and tribute to, to, to Prince Philip, and uh, uh, we did what we should. We think we thought we should do is to, uh, you know, pay, pay tribute to, to his uh, decades-long service to, uh, uh, to to the monarchy, but also I, I think to very important values. So I think we we join our British friends uh, in mourning uh, uh, Prince uh, Philip and wishing uh, the best to the family, in, port in particular to Her Majesty. I'd, I'd, let's move on then to um, some uh, news uh, that's been in, in the UK and EU headlines uh, recently from the United Kingdom. Uh, there has been violence in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's left quite a few dozen people injured. Now, just a few days ago, it was actually the 23rd anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement uh, that brought peace to Ireland and Northern Ireland after all these decades of, of bloodshed. Uh, do you believe that that peace agreement is in danger at this point? Well, you should know, and I'm, I'm sure you know, that the European Union has been, uh, you know, a great supporter of the peace and reconciliation process in Northern Ireland, in particular of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. We were there some, since the beginning, even before the beginning, uh, and we know that uh, both countries, uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland, belonging to the European Union at the time, uh, made a, a huge contribution to, uh, to this uh, agreement. We have been supporting it, we are still supporting it, also financially there are important projects and programs in Northern Ireland. I visited Northern Ireland uh, back in September and I talked to all of those that are engaged in these projects, being uh, the two communities together. So we are worried about the violence, we condemn the violence, we, we appealed for the end of the violence and we are uh, following it very attentively. When reporters go and speak to people in Northern Ireland, it seems that there are quite a few reasons being cited for this violence uh, breaking up. But uh, it, there does seem to be a lot of focus on the Northern Ireland protocol, the new arrangements that gives Northern Ireland a, a different status, really, from the rest of the United Kingdom. That's a huge bone of contention uh, for many of those who are, are, are very keen for Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. Um, some say that the Northern Ireland protocol part of the Brexit deal uh, should even be scrapped. Uh, what would be your response to that? Well, I think, as you said, there are many reasons for this uh, uh, violence and these riots, this unrest in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm not here to, to analyse in detail all that, uh, but we need to realise that one element of it is some concerns about uh, uh, the protocol that we signed with the British authorities. We are not um, uh, ignorant of the difficulties, the practical impact of some of the consequences of, of Brexit on Northern Ireland. And we are, the European Commission, uh, ourselves in London, uh, uh, the member states as well, all committed to finding the best practical solutions. The point being that we need to find them in, in a consensual way with our British friends, mm -hmm. not unilaterally, as sometimes the government has opted for. So we are actually, as we speak, and these days, working very hard, uh, technical level and political level, to find the right solution. Well, let's move on to some matters uh, relating to the COVID-19 pandemic now. Um, there have been uh, clashes, uh, so to speak, between the UK and the EU over the AstraZeneca vaccine in particular, about uh, how much of that vaccine will be supplied to each party. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Valle de Almeida, um, we're going to take a look at a report now with our viewers, put together by France 24's Mathilde Benizé and Luke Brown. Did the UK get better conditions because they signed their contract earlier? 
The UK vaccine contract was signed three months before the European agreement. So with the UK, we had three extra months to solve all the problems that we've come across. That's false. While the British may have started the negotiations earlier, the EU signed its contract with AstraZeneca on August the 27th, one day before London inked its deal. So why has the EU suffered so many delays in its deliveries? It all comes down to the terms of the contract, where the UK drove a much harder bargain. First up, London demanded and got a priority clause. That means that AstraZeneca has to supply the UK first, even if it means stalling deliveries to other customers, like the EU. And the UK forced AstraZeneca to meet five separate delivery deadlines, while the EU only got a much less stringent best effort provisional clause. What's more, if AstraZeneca fails to meet the UK's deadlines, London was liable to demand compensation, a provision that Brussels did not put in its contract. The EU did manage to get a better price, €1.78 for each dose, while the UK paid three and a half euros a price worth paying for the UK faced with a much higher death toll from the virus. And the EU did demand that AstraZeneca take legal responsibility for any negative side effects. That may seem wise given a tiny risk of blood clots, but that risk is still lower than that posed by COVID itself. All that means the UK is in champion form when it comes to vaccines with over 30 million people already getting their jab. Meanwhile, the European vaccine rollout is only now beginning to pick up speed. Joao Valle de Almeida, um, I know that you're not personally involved in striking those contracts, of course, but I'm sure you're well aware that there was a lot of outrage in the United Kingdom uh, over this issue of the vaccines, especially when EU heads of state and government said they would be prepared to block exports of vaccines uh, to protect EU supplies if needed. Now, the UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab accused the EU of brinkmanship. Others have talked about the EU waging a vaccine war on the UK. Uh, what's your response to all of that? Well, there is no vaccine war whatsoever. I think our enemy, our common enemy is, is the virus. Uh, the good news are, if you want me to, to quote the, the most uh, recent uh, numbers, that we have now delivered 126 million uh, doses to our to our uh, countries. Mm -hmm. We are on track to achieve our goal. Uh, so is the, the United Kingdom, and that's good because you know you're only fully protected if your neighbours are fully protected. So a success in the UK is good for us. And then we need to be very very clear and be, and very and very determined to protect the interests of uh, of our citizens and taxpayers. That's why we created this mechanism of transparency on exports, so that we know what happens to. Uh, what is produced in Europe. And let me give you a couple of other figures which are quite revealing. Mm -hmm. We have, we are the biggest exporter of vaccines. Now, we, I think the latest figure are 81 million doses being exported out of the EU to third countries, to 42 countries altogether, including the United Kingdom, by the way. We are the biggest exporter, but we are also the biggest supporter of COVAX. COVAX is the mechanism, together with Gavi, the mechanism that provides the best possible conditions for low- and middle-income countries to get access to vaccines. So I'm, I'm very proud of the efforts of the European Union. Nobody's perfect in the fight against the virus, but I think we can be proud of what we've been doing. Now, uh, just in terms of uh, European citizens who are resident inside the United Kingdom, they need to make sure that they've got their residency status uh, sorted out. There's a deadline of the end of June. Do you know how many people are you're still looking to reach uh, and what kind of demographics and uh, what issues are they having? Well, Catherine, thank you for raising this. And this allows me to, to launch an appeal, if I may, to all my fellow citizens, all the citizens of EU 27 member states that live and work and, and, uh, in the United Kingdom, don't forget to apply. Please uh, uh, go ahead and apply. We can help you if you go to our website, if you follow us on Twitter or Facebook or otherwise, you can find all the information, but go and register. The deadline is the 30th of June. It's very close now. I think by now the figures are about 5 million uh, European Union citizens have registered. Uh, we don't know how many they are, to be very frank, because not, not all of them are registered in consulates. The United Kingdom has no formal system of registration either. So we are trying to reach out to a maximum number of citizens. We do this together with the member states' embassies. Our main concern now are elderly people who are not necessarily 
electronically connected, mm -hmm. uh, children as well, uh, and some groups of population we are uh, a, a little bit outside of the mainstream in, in Britain and may not be fully connected to, to this. So my, my appeal for those uh, uh, watching uh, uh, France 24 in, in the UK and our citizens, please go and register now. There ain't much time left. Just one last question about your own status, if I may. The European Union uh, considers you to be its ambassador uh, to the United Kingdom, but the British government says the EU is not a nation state and therefore you can't be granted the same rights and immunity as an ambassador of, say, Portugal or, or France. Uh, what difference does this status make and do you expect the UK to change its mind? Well, uh, I'm confident that we can find a solution there, Bain. Uh, contacts established and I'm sure we'll find a solution which is in line with diplomatic practi practice around the world. We have uh, four, 142 other colleagues of mine that are EU ambassadors in all these countries from China to the United States to, to elsewhere and I've been myself in the US as ambassador with that status and, and at the UN. So I think it's only a matter of time that we can find the, the right solution. I'm confident that that will be the case because we our focus is uh, on, on the quality of our relationship. Uh, I believe even after divorce, even after Brexit, uh, the UK and the EU have a lot in common. Same values, a lot of strategic, uh, economic and political interests which are uh, shared. Uh, our, our economies are interlinked, mm -hmm. even our families are interlinked. And, and, and there's a lot of, uh, of rationale for a good relationship. And my purpose in London is to contribute modestly to the quality of that relationship. And I'm sure that is the case also on the British side. So there's a future for our relationship beyond Brexit. I like to say that is life uh, beyond Brexit. And that's where we'll leave our interview. Thank you so much, Joao Valle de Almeida. Thank you. Thanks to you as well for watching. Hope to see you very soon here on France 24 for more European news.